here today and before we hear the, the story and experience of Kansas, I thought it would be uh, informative for us to just have a, a broad overview of where we find ourselves here in North Carolina uh, in the wake of the 2013 tax plan that uh, essentially took a path that Kansas uh, took in regards to taking a tax cut approach to as a, as a strategy for boosting the economy here in North Carolina. And so just to provide you some context of what lawmakers in Ra here in Raleigh are facing as they prepare to put together uh, the next state budget for the next two years, uh, these are some things to, just to consider. So the 2013 tax plan is proven to uh, cost more than initially projected. So last year, uh, lawmakers found themselves having to address uh, a, a budget shortfall, essentially, of around half a billion dollars that they were not expecting. And we saw that uh, play out in how some of the, uh, the budget decisions were made in regards to cuts. and. And uh, disinvestments and decisions not to fund core areas of the budget. Uh, for this fiscal year, the original projections uh, showed the tax plan to uh, reduce revenues by about, by about $500 million. But what we are learning is that that cost could uh, actually end up near closer to $1 billion. And again, that goes back to the question of how do you make up for that revenue in your budget conversations and del deliberations. Uh, North Carolina schools and other services have been weakened in the face of these cuts. So today, uh, state spending for our public schools falls around $700 million short of what the budget was in place before the recession uh, uh, kicked into place. Uh, at our university level, we've seen state funding per student on a per student basis fall by about 11%, uh, whereas tuition and fees have increased on average by about 40%. So families and students are finding themselves having to pick up the slack of what uh, we're not doing at the state level in regards to the state budget, budget decisions. The tax cuts largely benefited the wealthy and profitable corporations. And so what we saw was a huge, uh, what well, we saw was a shift in the tax responsibility to low and middle income taxpayers and away from the wealthy and, and profitable corporations here in the state. And despite uh, all this that I'm telling you, we are still seeing proposals for more tax cuts that will continue this, this tax shift here in North Carolina. Uh, and finally, I'll just say that there's little evidence to believe uh, that the, these tax cuts are going to, uh, to boost North Carolina's economy. And what we'll hear from our Kansas friends here is that this was essentially the same uh, promise that was given to Kansas in regards to the, the massive tax cuts that took place in their states. And they're not seeing the fruits of that wonderful promise play out in the state and there are implications that could uh, impact us here in North Carolina and uh, in Kansas for generations here. So the decisions that we are, uh, that are being made now have implications for years to come and that's why it's important that this conversation is being had today. And so with that, I'll turn the floor back over. We'll have to give the floor to our guests. Join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you. Everyone and uh, thanks to the Justice Center for hosting us. It's been uh, a lovely 48 hours in North Carolina. Uh, the weather today is stunning, and I think that probably could be Kansas's tax policy at work. Uh, we're fond of saying that the sun is shining uh, because of our tax policy, although we know different in the state. Um, it's also a hard story to tell as proud Kansans, Dwayne and I, uh, to both in state and out of state, what we're doing. Uh, we're sort of eroding things that are very important to us and have helped certainly um, us get ahead in life. Um, but all that being said, I want to encourage you to visit Kansas because we need your sales tax revenue. Uh, so we're sort of striking a balance here uh, in terms of um, telling you this cautionary tale uh, and being sincere about it. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna sort of move through some things quickly, but just to give you a little bit of the budget background so you can have some context for what our state general fund looks like. It's certainly smaller than what North Carolina has, but proportionally about the same. Uh, and then we'll talk about those unprecedented changes and unafford unaffordable tax policy that we put into place and what we're looking at now and, and really what comes next. And since we've been here, actually just yesterday, uh, Kansas had some revision to our revenue estimates. And so we have sort of fresh new information to, to tell this story. So I'm going to let Dwayne start off uh, with looking at the budget overview and then we'll move through this. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be in North Carolina. Thank you for uh, inviting us and hosting us and, and uh, giving us some time to visit with you. Uh, as Andy said, we do hope you'll visit us in Kansas, but please don't copy our tax policy. <laughs> we have a cautionary tale to tell, and to tell that, uh, what I'd 
like to do is give just a little bit of budget background for what's what's uh, how Kansas is set up because I think that will help you uh, then understand the, the troubling financial issues that Kansas faces. The, the two big funds in Kansas are the highway fund and the state general fund. And that's, that's similar to almost every state. And I think you can understand what a highway fund is. Uh, it's there to fund our roads and, and our transportation system. The general fund is the biggest fund in state government, and it's where all of our problems lie. And I, I want to give just a little bit of uh, uh, background for you. Kansas spends its money, uh, I think, pretty much like North Carolina does, mostly on education. This is a, uh, a map of, of where our general fund spending goes, half into our public education system, where we have about a half a million uh, students, 20% uh, to pay for the Kansas share of Medicaid, 12% to higher education, another 6.7% to other human services, uh, uh, there's about 6% in here for public safety, which is very much, most, mostly our prison system, and then a little bit for general government. But the key thing to look at here is if you take other human services, Medicaid, higher ed, and, and uh, public education, the Kansas General Fund is spent out uh, almost 90% for education or human services in some way or another. And I, I'm sure that so there's some similar percentage for the North Carolina General Fund. Now think about this. If, if, uh, if, if you go back 10 years, go back 20 years, and consider what you were paying for different kinds of essential items then, food, clothing, automobiles, uh, housing, and then think about what you pay for those things today. Obviously, they have gone up. And all of us would, would just normally expect that 10 or 20 years from now, we're going to be paying more for those things than, than uh, we do now. And the same thing, though, is true for these kinds of state budget expenses. How easy is it to cut back or even keep things the same if you've got more kids coming into your education system, if you've got more demand on your higher education system? Certainly Medicaid, which is health care, goes up every year. There's no doubt about that. Every year, our Medicaid uh, costs that we must pay for go up. And that is true in North Carolina too, and I'm certain of it without even without even looking at your numbers, because it's happening and it, that happens in every state. So we've got general fund costs in Kansas that are going up. But on the revenue side, uh, we get most of our money to fund the general fund from individual income taxes and sales taxes. And then there are a smattering of other things, small things. We, we get a little money from a severance tax on oil and natural gas, and a little money from tobacco and liquor taxes. But the big deal is individual income tax and sales tax. And our current policy in Kansas right now is aimed at eliminating the individual income tax. It's aimed at taking it to zero somehow. So if you do that, imagine that. If you take our individual income tax to zero, and you've got growing expenses, what's going to happen? Uh, I, I'm going to turn back to Annie now, and she's going to tell you, uh, and she's going to show you how Kansas is attempting to take this to zero, and then we're going to put our revenue and expenditures together and show you what's happened. So not to get out sort of too far into the weeds on what we did with tax policy, but I think it's important to understand that there were two pieces to Kansas' unprecedented changes. And while 
we talk about that we've made tax cuts, we're only at the beginning of what's fondly referred to in the state of Kansas as the march to zero. Um, fondly referred to some, not all. Uh, but when we look at that, obviously you can see we made some changes to our income tax uh, brackets. We collapsed the top two, so we now have two brackets. Uh, and then we had a rate reduction. We just had another drop, drop in the top bracket uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, and then we moved to 2018. And after 2018, this really sort of archaic, complicated formula kicks in that continues to buy the rate down with, with excess revenue that comes into the state. Uh, and so that is the march to zero. Eventually, we will get to zero. We are on that path now. Nothing else needs to happen for Kansas to get to zero. Once we get to zero on individual income tax rates, which you remember is about 43% of our state general fund, next in line is the corporate income tax. So by the time we get all the way finished with this part of the tax package, we're talking about eliminating nearly 50% of our general fund revenue. The other big piece, though, was this business pass-through exemption from tax. We eliminated income tax on what we thought was 191,000 small businesses. That's what we went into the 2012 plan understanding. What we know now in 2015 was that it wasn't 191,000 small businesses, it was 330,000 small businesses in the state of Kansas no longer pay income tax. It didn't target a specific size firm or profit margin. It's every small business in Kansas doesn't pay income tax anymore. Uh, obviously, the price tag for that is much higher than was originally estimated. Conveniently, in that sort of misestimation, we actually forgot to count the 55,000 farmers who are registered as LLCs and, and other small businesses. Kind of remarkable because we are an agricultural state. Uh, but, but be that as it may, we missed that mark. We couldn't do this, though, without some take fours or some revenue increases. Had we just left it like this, we would have bankrupted the state immediately, overnight. So some of our pay fours uh, were regressive in nature and really shifted, as, as, as Cedric talked about in North Carolina, the burden uh, to lower income Kansans. The sales tax rate was supposed to sunset at the same time this tax policy uh, change kicked in, and so we, we kept it at an elevated percentage. We also eliminated some pretty important income tax deductions and credits for low-income and vulnerable Kansans. Uh, we do still have an earned income tax credit. That's sort of the one feature that remains. Um, but what we did away with was the child independent care credit. We did away with the refundable portion of the food sales tax rebate. Uh, we did away with the property tax credit for renters. And we did away with all of those things, and obviously it still didn't go far enough uh, in terms of offsetting the revenue loss. In, in the end, um, what we estimated when we started this was that we would collect $3.7 billion less just through 2018. Again, that doesn't take us all the way to zero, and this estimation is obviously at this point we know too low uh, because we missed the mark on the small business piece. Using analysis from our friends at the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, we took a look at what happened in just the first full year of the Kansas tax cuts. And from this, you can really see the significant shift to the poorest 40% of Kansans. 40% of Kansans actually saw their taxes go up uh, by way of raising the sales tax and, and eliminating those, uh, those tax credits. And we can see then that the top 1% gained uh, just a little under $20,000 in just the first full year. This does not take into account that we saw 70 out of Kansas' 105 counties raise property taxes in the first full year of the tax cuts. Uh, we've seen sales tax initiatives at the local level go up across the state to pay for investments that the state no longer is contributing to. Uh, we also have seen schools implement fees where there were once none. Um, so while money is being left in the pockets of some Kansans, really just a uh, few when we're talking about it, um, it's coming out of the other pocket just to hold the line on services, not really to make any gains across the state. So Dwayne's going to take a little bit of a look then at sort of what we're facing now and what it means between the money coming in and the money going out. Let's chart what actually happened. This is a, this is a chart which gives you an indication from 2000 on up to the present of money coming into our state general fund. That's the green line. And the red line is money going out. And you can start clear back here. You can see there's a little bit of a dip. That's a recession right there that corresponds to the <coughs> Paris to tax in New York, followed by a really good economic time where, where income goes.
goes up without any kind of uh, uh, tax increases, spending stays below income. Then we get to a point here where revenue drops three years in a row pretty sharply. That's the Great Recession. And Kansas entered that period uh, with a fair amount of money in the bank and spent it uh, for two years, spent more than what came in in an attempt uh, to keep things going, hoping that the recession would end. And in Kansas, it didn't end. And things went bad for a third year. And there were a lot of budget cuts that had to be put in place. But you can see then what, what happened right after that. At, at this point in time, Kansas, uh, Kansas lawmakers knew that there was uh, trouble ahead. If something didn't happen, there would be more budget cuts. So lawmakers put in place, after a lot of debate, a three-year, one-cent sales tax to try to get the, get the state out of that. And you can see the first year there, the second year there, but our, our current governor took office about right here uh, as the recession, as we were coming out of the recession. And our big income tax changes began here, just started to phase in, and then in the first full year of implementation of those income tax cuts, here's our drop in revenue. We fall 700 million or 11% in revenue from the year before. That is a huge drop. Up until this point, the Kansas, this, this kind of a graph would be pretty similar to what you would have seen in almost any state. You would see a dip here, there's a recession. You could see that all states had trouble during the Great Recession. Then you see recovery starting. But where Kansas differs from other states is this drop right here. Other states don't have that coming out of the recession. We have it because of our tax cuts. In, as the tax cuts were implemented, uh, it sounded great. It sounded magical. You could cut taxes, and revenue would continue to come in. The economy would grow. But did that happen? No. You can see the, the result of it. Uh, Revenue didn't come in, it fell sharply. Now, for fiscal year 2015, which is the fiscal year we're in right now, if, if you look forward, it looks like revenue is going up. These, are the, these were the official forecasts for revenue until yesterday. And now, uh, lawmakers have had to lower the forecasts because money is, its revenue continues to fall. Not, uh, not grow. So now the official forecast is more of a flat line. But then look at spending. Although, if you go back here and draw a line, spending has not increased very sharply. It is still, uh, these are the budgets that our very, really quite conservative Senate has passed. They, they, they've passed so far. This, this legislative session. And there are almost $700 million above, above revenue. That's a problem. <laughs> now, in, in the first year of these tax cuts, as revenue fell, uh, spending was pulled down. Uh, it's a little dip in spending there. That's principally uh, achieved by moving some of our school finance costs over to the highway fund. That's, that's how that dip happens, otherwise that would have continued to go up. The rest of this gap in fiscal year 2014 was filled by taking money from our reserves or from our bank account. Now we're in fiscal year 2015. This year is almost over. This gap, uh, which has just grown, is being covered by taking the remaining amount of reserves, emptying our bank account, drawing more money directly from the highway fund, just reaching in, taking money out, and putting it in the general fund, and cleaning out just about the balance of just about every other fund in state government that had any kind of balance that could be taken. That just barely 
gets us through this fiscal year. And now lawmakers are trying to budget for fiscal year 2016 and fiscal year 2017. And the revenue, new revenue estimate is actually down here now. Uh, their first pass at the budget is up there. And there's no money in the bank. Our reserves are gone. And so what's going to happen? We don't know. We're, uh, we are awaiting that now. Our legislature is in recess. They're coming back next week. And they've passed an initial budget, which is up here, but of course it doesn't work. And so either there's going to have to be a tax increase of some kind to push revenue up, or an already conservative budget is going to have to be reduced in a way that it's even more damaging than what we have already experienced. So we're in a really tough spot. This has not worked out well. And by now, most Kansans understand it. They understand that, that, that uh, the tax cuts haven't meant prosperity. They have meant a really terrifically big budget problem that's going to cause trouble for schools and for human service programs. One of the things I appreciate about Wayne is he's uh, really measured in his tone, and so by saying it's not working out well, I think it's probably uh, one of the biggest understatements that can be made about what's happening in Kansas. You know, when we talk about, and Dwayne mentioned that we've pulled from accounts and we've cleaned out funds, um, a couple of things I just want to point out about this is that we lost more money in just the first full year of the tax cuts than we did in the three years of the Great Recession combined. You know, none of us had a choice about participating in the Great Recession. And Kansas absolutely had a choice about participating uh, on this unprecedented, unaffordable path. Um, but yet still we stay on it at this point. When we talk about this, it's really impacting all Kansans, from our youngest kids to our oldest folks. We have raided the bank account of our littlest Kansans. We have cleaned out the Endowment for Youth Fund, which supports early childhood programs, and left it empty for the next two fiscal years to try and plug that hole. We have cut uh, services to seniors like Meals on Wheels to try and plug that hole. We have a uh, uh, education system that has been ruled multiple times by our state Supreme Court as being um, unconstitutionally underfunded. And we still have a court case pending. But what that meant coming out of the recession, so this infographic comes from a report that we produced, and this was coming out of the recession. This doesn't take into account what we're doing now and forward. We've seen class sizes grow. We've had more Kansas kids coming into classrooms but fewer teachers. I mentioned the fees that we're implementing, the property taxes that we're raising, we're still not getting ahead. And you think about what attracts businesses to states, what keeps people and businesses in a state, and it certainly is a thriving educational system, which we're compromising now. Uh, when we think about this also, this comes from a report that we released just last week where we looked at the impacts to locals. What was happening across the state in terms of uh, local investments. And I mentioned the property tax increases that we're seeing and sales tax initiatives. We've seen aid to local governments go down, no surprise, as we've lost revenue. We've lost ground in education and libraries and county health departments and mental health. Um, and corrections, while they've seen an increase, it's still below pre-recession levels. And all of these things matter to our Kansas communities. All of these things matter to uh, keeping people there and attracting new folks in. And so as we continue to wrestle with uh, revenue problems as a state because of this ill-advised tax policy, we're going to continue to see this trend across Kansas with our local communities picking up the tab. Um, and again, just sort of trying to hold the line. That really is the sort of end of our cautionary tale. Um, if there's anything that we could implore you to do is that, uh, is, is hear us when we say that the tax cuts do not pay for themselves. It doesn't matter whether you go sort of as big and bold as Kansas did or you do it uh, in, in smaller, more incremental measures. The revenue will not come in, but it will come at an expense to your state. At this point, we have gambled Kansas's future away. Dwayne and I didn't talk extensively about the bonding that's happening in our state, but it is a path that we are traveling down. As we raid the highway fund, we then issue bonds to plug some of those holes. We're building new bridges, but we're not paving the roads that lead up to them. Um, and, and so it, it's, it's really uh, unfortunate. We do have opportunities to, to reverse course, and we have called on policymakers to repeal the tax cuts of 2012 and 2013. We'll let, let you know how that goes. Um, but
But in all of this, we are also considering as a state a whole host of tax raisers to pay for the tax cuts. We're talking about raising our sales tax. We're talking about raising our motor fuels tax. We're talking about putting an income surcharge on. We'll, do, we'll reduce income tax rates, but then we'll just charge you a flat rate across the top of that. And so we're looking for ways to pay for this because it's really clear that you can't go down this path and, and actually you know, provide the services that are necessary to the state. So on that uplifting note, uh, Dwayne and I would be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Great. I also regret that while the, both uh, Dwayne and Annie have been to the General Assembly and will probably go back there this afternoon after their uh, presentation before they fly back to Kansas in, uh, late this afternoon. We haven't gotten them a meeting with Bob Rucho yet. <laughs> <laughs> Bob is the Senate uh, Finance Committee Chair who is sort of one of the top champions of the slash and burn tax policy that we're seeing here in North Carolina that in very many ways sort of mimics what's going on in Kansas. We'll keep trying. But are there questions that folks have? Yes, uh, Judy. Are you a home rule state? The question is whether Kansas is a home rule state. North Carolina, of course, is not a home rule state. Uh, mostly. Uh, the simple answer is yes, we are. But our, our, our local, our local uh, cities and counties uh, still have rules that they have to operate under in terms of what they can raise, uh, the kinds of monies that they can raise locally. Uh, they're pretty much free to do what they want with the property tax. Uh, but have limits on whether they can impose uh, a sales tax or a local, no, nobody can impose a local income tax, but they have some opportunity to do sales. Yeah. Yes, Sabre. What was your rate before the increase? The income the tax, tax rate. rate. The sales tax rate. And uh, is it state only? Uh, we had a, a sales tax rate of 5.3%, uh, state only that we then raised to 6.3%, uh, which was supposed to be in place for only a three-year period uh, to get us out of the recession, and then it was to drop back to 5.7. <laughs> it's a little complicated. Uh, now it is at, rather, it is at 6.15 now uh, in order to pay for some of the tax cuts. We have lowered income tax rates sharply and exempted businesses from income tax completely, for the most part, raised some other taxes to pay for some of it. But even so, even after raising some other taxes, even after shifting the burden of taxes to uh, lower income and middle income uh, Kansans, we still have this very large loss of revenue. Okay, follow, follow up, up question. Okay, I think you tax food, but what, to what extent do you tax services? Uh, we tax food on the sales tax. What? Well, yeah, sorry. The question was uh, tax food, but do you tax services? And yes, Kansas is one of the few states that has a sales tax on food, full sales tax. Uh, we do not do a very great job of tax and services, some, but uh, there are many that we do not tax. Uh, go ahead, um, Struggling with the two North Carolinas that we're supposed to be making one, it would seem as though this type of policy in effect creates two. Those counties like Wake that are more wealthy can raise property taxes because the citizens are going to value it. Those counties that are rural and, and mostly agricultural, the farmers can't afford to pay higher property taxes. Are you seeing two Kansas? Absolutely. That's, that same kind of dynamic is, is true in Kansas. Uh, uh, the county closest to Kansas City, which is one of the wealthiest counties in the, in the nation, can easily uh, raise property taxes and cover cover some portion of school costs, but rural Kansas, uh, the rest of the, can of the state, has uh, much more trouble. And in our current policy, we'll, we'll exaggerate that, that uh, Let's see, uh, Miriam. I was interested in the center's campaign, and among the options you were considering, if I heard you correctly, or maybe they're considering, 
a sales tax increase, which is They're also regressive yes. and hits yeah. the same low income who are paying the bulk of the taxes so the, uh, the wealthy and the corporations cannot pay any. But and with that, I just wondered if part of go over that and, and whether or not the campaign also includes a kind of corporate um, counterinsurgency around the tax or the wealthy and corporate. So the, question, better plan? the question was, uh, you know, sort of I mentioned there towards the end the, uh, the smorgasbord of revenue raisers that Kansas is considering. And, and I, when I used we, it was sort of a universal we. Uh, the Kansas Center for Economic Growth is not proposing those or pushing those initiatives. Uh, in fact, what we're fighting is another cut to the, uh, or a proposal to cut the earned income tax credit. The state policymakers are considering those bevy of proposals, including raising the sales tax. And you're right, it is regressive. Uh, when you look at all of the things that are in queue, the revenue raisers that policymakers are going to consider when they come back, it's really clear that we've run out of pockets to pick for the lowest income folks, and we're moving up the food chain. Every Kansan stands in this line out of their pockets pick to pay for this unaffordable tax policy. Um, so it, it is regressive in terms of um, our uh, campaign around it. Um, we're focused on working behind the scenes with moderates, and, and, and we have a, a little bit different uh, makeup in terms of our policymakers. We have a strong moderate caucus in Kansas that we work closely with. I know. That's right. in the Republican Party. Yes, yes. Moderate caucus. Um, don't mean to brag, but hey, you know, we don't have much less money. On the other hand, you only have, what, 25 or 30 Democrats out of 100? 100, 145, uh, uh, 65, excuse me. Yeah. We, we have a, a pretty small Democratic caucus. We have a moderate caucus. But working with them behind the scenes, uh, leveraging um, uh, analysis from our national partners like the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy to really inform them about the impacts of these proposals. And, and really, at this point, say, you know, there's, there is a magic bullet. The magic bullet is to reverse course. Um, at this point, a lot of these proposals that we're considering are really small amounts of money and aren't going to be long-term sustainable paths for the state of Kansas. We're going to continue to see it exacerbate uh, the gap, uh, the growing gap between uh, the haves and have-nots in our state while we are reducing services. So we're really eroding the safe safety net at the same time. Um, and so the future is not looking really bright in terms of this broadly shared prosperity. So those are things we, we frequently talk about in a lot of publications that we put out around that. So what's the secret to getting moderate Republicans? The question is how do we get the moderate Republicans to turn around? <laughs> You know, I will say this, and I mean, I think Dwayne can speak to this too. While while Kansas, and what you know now, uh, looks extreme, we have long been, while a red state, a very moderate state. Um, at the ground level, I mean, this is this is sort of not um, typical the the path that we've chosen in terms of uh, the the opinion and I think beliefs of most Kansans. We have we have been sort of an austere but adequate state, taking care of one another, making sure our, our roads are paved and our kids are educated. So. So it looks a little bit different, I think, than, uh, than how it looks appears to you all in North Carolina, and then also in terms of, of uh, the, the belief system of our policymakers. So we have long been a fairly moderate. We've, we've actually seen this shift towards a more conservative place, pushing forward with these uh, really unprecedented policies. They also informed me yesterday that Coke Industries has a big uh, presence in Kansas. Am I right? By big, it's headquartered yeah. in Wichita, <laughs> Kansas, so, oh, which is say, the state's largest city. A very influential player. We've got a couple questions in the back. I don't, I'm going to go to the way back. Yes, you, sir. Yeah. You. Yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, this may not play your expertise, but I'll ask it anyway. How did the governor get reelected? How did the governor get reelected? <laughs> During the election campaign, the governor basically just looked Kansans in the eye, and, and the very words he used is, the sun is shining in Kansas, and don't let anybody tell you different. The opposition, the, his opponent, tried very hard to outline what was ahead for Kansas but you had these sort of two competing views of what was actually happening. And many Kansans began to understand, and the election uh, for, uh, it was very narrow, which was unusual for, uh, for, for a, a sitting Republican governor in Kansas to almost get defeated, uh, was uh, pretty unusual all in itself. But then, a week after the election was over, 
uh, the bottom fell out, the revenue of forecasts were, were changed, uh, and it became very clear that everything was really much worse than, than uh, uh, outlined during the election campaign. And so by now, uh, it's pretty clear, oh, <laughs> things, have, things have continued to deteriorate every day since, since the election campaign, and many more Kansans now uh, have understood and are, are comprehending that we're on a track that isn't working well. Right there, next one. Just, just to follow up, do you have a sense of kind of what the top line messages are that work with the public and talk speaking out against the tax cuts? What are the top line messages that work with the public on these kinds of issues? Um, at first, these kinds of tax cuts sound great. They're very seductive. Uh, you can cut taxes and still get the same amount of revenue, and you can get economic growth. Well, what's not to like about that? I mean, it, it sounds great, and if you if you if you grab onto that, it you, you don't realize that that's a mistake until revenue doesn't come in until programs start to get cut. And that's finally what's happening in Kansas now. You, it's, it's like you actually have to see that happen before, uh, before you realize, oh, that's, that's, that's not something that works. The, the, the tax cuts in Kansas were based on, I think, two false premises. One is that if you cut taxes, revenue will still come in. And we have seen very clearly it did it. It fell. It fell very sharply. And the second premise is that, well, it will be easy to control spending. It will be easy to, to just keep spending in check and bring it down. And that has proved to be very difficult for even a conservative set of lawmakers in Kansas as they face uh, public education and, and human service programs, uh, spending goes up. It, 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 it naturally goes that way, and it's very difficult to just bring that down without doing tremendous damage, and politically it's very hard. And so now, we've come to, the, we've come to that sort of, that, uh, I think, a tipping point where it's clear revenue's fallen, and it's very difficult to bring the spending down, and so now what are we going to do? And so we've got we've got we've got lawmakers, even conservative ones, realizing, oh, we're going to have to raise revenue. We're going to have to raise taxes. Now they're looking at regressive, especially at regressive kinds of tax tax raisers to to cover for this this, <laughs> or to the extent that they can, they've grabbed our reserves and used those all up. But. Uh, it's, it's, it's like you have to almost get to that tipping point for people to really grasp it. It's one of the reasons why we're here. Um, <laughs> we encourage you not to get that far down the path. I think one of the things I'd just say about that, about top line messages, is that um, when, when we first started down this path, it was clear that there was a shift. Um, but but our, our policymakers are not altogether uh, concerned with fairness. Um, so we then talked to both policymakers and the Kansas public about maintaining what has made Kansas uh, long a great state, which is our public school system. Uh, we, we've really kind of held back uh, charter uh, movement. So we have this really um, robust, thriving K-12 system. Uh, we also have a great transportation structure. Um, we're also not Missouri, uh, so we use that a lot. And in order to maintain that, you know, we, we have prided ourselves on investments in those areas. Uh, when we started down this path, uh, the governor said, proclaimed, look out Texas, here comes Kansas. And we quickly elevated what that meant. It wasn't about being a no-income tax state. It was that Texas had higher uninsured rates, ch higher childhood poverty, higher things that Kansas did not want to have. So we lifted that piece up as well. Um, as we uh, talk today, uh, we also talk about the sort of fiscal irresponsibility of this. It's like Kansas had a full-time job and then decided to go to part-time but not figure out a way to pay its bills. And that's something that everyday Kansans can connect to. When we think about, you know, that in addition then we're using credit cards to meet our basic needs. 
that this is not long-term sustainable for our state. So those are some of the ways that we've framed it and that it's really connecting with the everyday Kansan. Uh, because when we started down this path, as Dwayne said, it was very seductive. And we said, we're going to leave more money in your pocket and you get to spend it how you want. Right? Uh, we did not say the, and again, we, the Universal We, not the Kansas Center, <laughs> Uh, policymakers and proponents of this path did not give the rest of the explanation was we're going to leave some money and then we're going to go grab it and it's going to be a pretty mediocre at best path that we travel forward on. One, one, one more, just a quick add on, one more important uh, part of getting Kansas to understand is that our bond rating was reduced twice. That happened, uh, I guess we're shut off here, but it happened uh, uh, as as revenues plummeted and spending stayed up and we started to dig into our reserves, uh, Moody's and Standard and Poor's pulled our bond rating down and Kansas started to catch on then. Uh, that, was, that was sort of an outside group looking at this and saying, you're not doing this right. Let's go to Bill Wilson. Uh, you mentioned that sort of rating of the funds. I don't know whether you're K-12 teachers or part of your state pension fund, but what's been the impact on uh, yes, our, our teachers are part of our public pension and the Kansas pension is underfunded and the state is on a, a path to put more into that pension fund each year in order to bring it uh, into better financial health. But one of the cuts that has happened uh, as part of the effort to balance this out is to stop that increase of money sent to the pension fund and that's one of the one of the actions our governor took this year to bridge the gap that uh, has has opened up but it's one of the costs I mean if we were doing this correctly Kansas should keep paying in putting more money into the pension system it's one of the costs that we have that we have to work into our into our uh, uh, normal budget Things like that move up, and we have to figure out ways to pay for them. Uh, yeah. Did you find that this enormous gap that happened in the weekly revenues and spending that that was primarily just because of bad estimates and wishful thinking, or is there something in the dynamics of the economy that people saw other taxes go up, so they spent less and growth was less? And, you know, which, how do you describe those two influences? I believe it was both missed estimates and wishful thinking. I believe that there was not, there, there's never been, in, in, in how Kansas did this, there's never been a hard numbered spreadsheet of here's what we're going to do, here's how it'll affect revenue, here's what we can expect in the years down the line, and here's, here is how things will work out. That never happened. It was it was a hope. It was a, it was a belief that if we do this, things are going to be good. It, will, it, it was magical thinking, if you will. And at the start, it sounded great, but it has not worked. Well, I guess then, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, I just wondered why Kansas and North Carolina and Wisconsin, some of you know, the other states that are trying to read it, why can't they look at what happened? already got a state that did it with the you know, taxpayer bill of rights in part of Colorado. Yeah. And they had to wait for a Republican governor who said, I cannot believe I should state this budget you know, to the American uh, Senate. The question is, why haven't we learned from Colorado, which went down this road of a Taxpayer Protection Act or Taxpayer Bill of Rights 20 years ago? Um, so I'll say that when we started down this path to, to sort of piggyback off of Dwayne's magical thinking, there's actually an interview uh, with Governor Brownback and the Wall Street Journal Washington bureau chief uh, about this in, in June of 2013, so just after we passed the second round. And uh, Governor Brownback says, you know, we're, we're wanting to trade income tax for sales tax. And he says, I don't know how it works, but it works. <laughs> and you're, I have to send you the link to the video. Um, but be that as it may, there was this notion, this sort of proud notion that Kansas would get there. We would be the first state to do it. And at the time, they said that it would work, right? There was no mention made about uh, shrinking government or reducing the size of government. That was not part of what was sold to the Kansas public. 
And when, you know, you know, roughly 18, 24 months later, there was some ambition on the part of proponents that, well, yes, there was some goal here to reduce the size of government. So that was June of this past summer, and then not six months later, all of those same folks were saying, well, we might need just a little bit more money. Uh, because bending the curve of government here to meet our revenue line is not possible without sort of shutting the lights off in, in half of Kansas schools or, you know, no longer just uh, educating every kid west of the middle of the state, right? It's just not possible. Um, so, and as we talk about it now, and, and why can't we own the fact that this isn't working, it's, it, and it seems that pride often gets in the way for some of these, but increasingly we do see not only moderates, but then other folks kind of out just on the fringe of that saying, gosh, I'm really starting to see the impact this is having in my community. We have school districts who have petitioned the state for emergency funds to make payroll in June. Um, that, you know, and, and, and asking about the election, uh, you know, why weren't there other decisions made by Kansans? Well, we had some money in the bank account to ride this out. So the pain had not come home yet. And at this point, it is. Uh, school districts are closing buildings. They're ending the school year a week or two weeks early. They're petitioning to make payroll. We have rural hospitals suffering. Obviously, this doesn't take into account Medicaid expansion, which I, I know you all have talked about as well. Um, but so. Let's go to Alan Fryer. Uh, so here, uh, I'm sure our budget back home. Our, our legislature pitched, pitched tax cuts as an economic development strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the fisc your fiscal argument makes it clear tax cuts don't pay for themselves. But there's this whole other economic argument, or set of arguments that you can use to show the tax cuts don't work. And I just wanted to get a handle sort of on how you're talking about, specifically the economic piece, job, employment, right? Yeah. So, and it's something that I mean, we have, certainly have a lot of other um, uh, blog posts, infographics that we produced looking at that. Um, because it, it has been trotted out by proponents that, oh, things are going great in Kansas. It's true, we've added private jobs, so has everybody else. When you look at the rate, though, of Kansas' private job growth, it trails the region, it trails the nation. Um, when you look at our unemployment, while dropping, it's dropping everywhere. Um, it, it's called the recovery, right? And so some of these things are happening and occurring naturally in Kansas' economy in accordance with everywhere else. But the, the metrics that we said we were going to measure this by, we are not outperforming other states. Those other states didn't enact massive tax cuts, are getting revenue, are investing in the things that matter, and are having superior job growth. When we do look at the types of jobs Kansas is adding, though, what's interesting about it is they're low-wage jobs, right? So in that notion of look out, Texas, here comes Kansas, we're falling right behind them. Uh, and increasing retail and food industry and home health care aids, also jobs that are uninsured. So when correspondingly, the problems that we're going to see moving into Kansas' future are a greater number of folks living in poverty or just above the poverty line, struggling to make ends meet, uninsured, cost of uncompensated health care, right on and on and on. Um, so so and, and we could talk about gross state product and a lot of other things, but we certainly are not outperforming our region, which was uh, the goal. And when we also talk about we had hoped to bring people into the state of Kansas, um, unfortunately, we lost 4,200 folks in the first full year of the tax cuts. Um, you know, they've gone to high tax states that are offering good services like Oregon and, uh, uh, and New York and uh, some other places. We have a lot of folks come from Missouri, but we kind of expect that. Um, so, so in that, and all kidding aside, we often have a lot of border crossing, right, coming back and forth from our surrounding states, but, but we saw people leaving. And you think about this as the, as the, the lights dim in the state, Right, who's gonna go? Folks who are mobile. Um, and we're gonna leave behind a tax base that's gonna be unable to support the needs of the state and, and really kind of um, watch Kansas crumble. Phil, we've got a time for just a couple more questions. Okay. I would like to ask about the uh, how uh, vocal and how militant various individuals are most seriously impacted by this kind of fiscal uh, uh, scheme. And do you see any evidence that they're gaining any traction? Are folks fighting back? I don't know that I would use the word militant. Uh, that's not sort of go hand in hand with the Kansas personality. Um, uh, but what I will see, say is that when we look at this kind of the trajectory of uh, movement from 2012 to 2014 and now kind of projecting into 2016, we've seen a lot of advocacy groups and grassroots organizations form, particularly around education. 
uh, parent groups um, that are concerned with growing classroom sizes and reduced quality of education. And so those are starting to take hold across the state. We also had uh, a Women for Kansas group uh, pop up and is now starting chapters across the state. So there's certainly a lot more activity. Dwayne and I travel the state um, spreading the good word uh, for those who just uh, apparently haven't felt it yet. But, but what's interesting about that is as we do that and we say, you know, here's what it looks like, and it really connects to their experiences, their lived experiences. They don't feel like the sun is shining, but they haven't yet wrapped their heads around the tax policy and what it's meant to them. So I think that increasingly across the state, we're seeing a lot more activity and kind of a ground swell. Um, 2016 will be kind of the next measuring point as to whether or not people fully have embraced this um, understanding. I'd like to respond just briefly also to say that, and this could be a, a lesson for North Carolina uh, yeah. in looking at us. At first, some of our advocacy groups were, uh, they were timid, or maybe even, you might say, afraid to challenge this policy. It, it sounded good. It, <laughs> it, uh, uh, they didn't want to get get on the, the, the bad side, so to speak, of the, the, the bad political side of the governor and the, and the ruling uh, and, and set of uh, policy makers. And so they were slow to, to challenge and to understand that in the long run, uh, this was gonna have really dramatic consequences. I'd encourage North Carolina groups, uh, don't look at the short term as, as much as you look at the long term because, I mean, uh, a short term gain to kind of fix things up, uh, but yet allowing uh, longer term uh, bad financial strategy to be put in place, is uh, that's not a good recipe. Speak up now. If you've got time for one more question. Okay. that has been um, passed by and large in the last two or three years. We have a lot of ALEC templates. Um, this included, uh, we just uh, passed, signed into law, um, some putting into statute some TANF uh, pieces last, uh, last week. Um, so we certainly, our House Speaker and our Senate President um, are heavily involved in ALEC, as are a lot of our more conservative members of our legislature. Um, so they, they certainly, a lot of proposals that they're moving through the Kansas legislature. Well, folks, we really thank you very much for joining us today.